Hi, everyone, and welcome to our research methods talk on latent variable modeling. I'm excited to have you all here today. This is one of my favorite topics to cover because it's one of my specialties. Uh, so we're going to talk about what is latent variable modeling. We're going to go into some of a uh, little bit more theoretics than I've done in the past, as well as kind of under what circumstances you'd want to use this me this method. Um, and then we're actually going to work through some code and then walk through step by step of how to do this. Uh, so before we begin talking about the theoretics of latent variable modeling or anything like that, I'm going to go ahead and put in the, the Zoom chat. This is going to be a tiny URL that's going to redirect you to a Google Drive. This has the example code, the data set. It also has annotations for... I'm just going to go ahead and mute someone. There we go. Uh, apologies about that. So... um. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead. Uh, if you want to go ahead and download all that information, by all means, uh, go for it. So this is uh, again link to the R code, the data set output, as well as some helpful articles and a little bit of presentation about confirmatory factor analysis. We're gonna use that as the foundations for all the stuff we're gonna be doing today. Um, so again, let me go ahead and put that link in the chat. Um, out of curiosity, if you can go ahead and use like the thumbs up or a thumbs down. If you've ever done like a CFA or any sort of structural equation modeling, I'd be really curious on who's um, kind of who's already doing that type of work. So feel free to use the emoticon. Okay, I see so, some, some thumbs up. Okay, very cool, very cool. Awesome. Yeah, so um, this one, it doesn't have any potential, I'm not assuming any prior knowledge on structural equation modeling. So it's be really basic, but we're going to go from how to do a measurement model, which is essentially the foundation of the house, all the way up to measurement invariance, as well as structural regressions. So then how we can actually use latent constructs as our outcome and our predictors rather than just manifest variables, so just observe scores. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. And we're going to go kind of do kind of a quick essentially a quick primer on what a CFA is and kind of what, what I'm talking about here. So full disclosure, um, I'm trained as an experimental psychologist. My area of specialty though for research is psychometrics. So I love latent variable modeling, IRT, all that fun stuff. So this is this is my happy place, so to speak, for quant. So when talking confirmatory factor analysis, it's just another tool for the tool belt. It's a way of us to be able to provide a, a measure on something that we can't actually measure. Uh, that sounds kind of a little bit strange, but that's essentially what we're trying to do here. So some acronyms, though, and some synonyms that we need to kind of think through. A factor is also the invariable. A factor is a construct. These are all interchangeable things. We're going to use them. I'm going to tend to mostly use it as a latent variable just to differentiate from an exploratory factor analysis. If we were to think of it as a continuum, on one side we have an, an exploratory factor analysis, on the other part of the continuum we have a confirmatory. You can have exploratory confirmatory, you can have uh, more constrained exploratory analyses, so it, it's really kind of a continuum. Uh, when we're talking about factor coefficients, so this is just the correlation between the item to the factor. Higher values indicate that the item to the factor are well correlated, and as they should. If a factor has a low coefficient, then that's an issue. So the idea is when we're thinking about a latent variable, uh, if a person is more depressed and we're measuring depression as our latent construct, we tend to see a higher indication or higher selection of higher categories on an item if they're like or scaled. So it's like I have a hard time uh, going about my day. Well, if they say strongly agree to that compared to like slightly agree, then we know that's going to be probably a higher level of depression if we were measuring depression. Uh, so for confirmatory factor analysis, we're going to be within the classical test theory realm. That's the idea that we have an observed score. So what we actually can measure using a me or like a, a depression measure, it's going to be a true score. So someone's actual score of depression plus some error. So again, this is going to be classical test theory. You could do things like an IRT or item response theory, which has a different conceptualization, uh, but that might be a, a workshop for another time. If folks are interested in IRT, let me know. Always happy to share stuff and have some fun tutorials on that. Uh, but this idea is the confirmatory factor analysis. That's going to be the starting point for structural equation modeling. Once we have a good measurement model, so measurement model, confirmatory factor analysis, it's the same thing. So once we have a good measurement model and we're, we can feel comfortable and confident in what we're measuring with that model, 
then we can actually look at, well, how this construct relates to other constructs, keeping it at the construct level. Now, the benefit of structural equationing modeling is if we're talking about like depression and talking about um, anxiety, happiness, so all these things are constructs. Sure, we can have measures to try to get reflections of those, but we don't really have a, we don't have a scanner that can just point at someone and be like, okay, this is your depression score without any measurement error. Well, we can't really do that. I mean, that'd be good if we had that technology. That means my job would, as a psychometrician would essentially be mute, but we don't have that. So instead, what we do is we try to do some data triangulation. We try to get someone's proxy or how well, based on several, or several items, how well we can actually measure that construct. How, how depressed are they? How happy are they? So we do have some software that has SCM and CFAs built in. So that's going to be R and plus, SAS, Stata, JASP, Jamovi. Um, those all have built-in options. M plus is super expensive. Uh, Stata has some good options, though. Jasp, Jamovi are all free. So I tend to prefer those personally because I don't want to pay for something if I can do it for free. Uh, that being said, M plus can do some really fancy stuff. But uh, if you all interested in that, let me know, and I can happy to chat on some of the pros and cons with that. Um, but a lot of folks use SPSS. The downside with SPSS is if you want to do structural equationing modeling, you have to buy AMOS, which is a whole other license which we don't have through AU. Um, if you're thinking about AMOS, let me know, and I can walk you through how to use the AU license with the single purchase of AMOS and connect all that together. It's a bit of a pain, but it's doable. So if you're interested in doing that, let me know, and I can walk you through that. So with confirmatory factor analysis, the idea is we have these a set of items and they're all measuring different facets of a construct. In this construct, we can't directly measure. So we're just trying to get a good proxy. Uh, this differs from EFA based on a research question. So the idea is we have this structure in mind. We believe that maybe um, happiness or depression, like for depression, it's a single unidimensional factor. So when I say unidimensional, it's not like subscales within this. It's not like post-traumatic stress where we have um, different aspects of PTSD symptomology. So when we talk about unidimensional model, it's all measuring the same part of depression. It's all measuring the same thing. It's not a subset within this. And we're really testing how well our theoretical model fits the data. And we really need to determine as researchers how we essentially are creating that model. And I'm gonna walk you through that step by step. This is all really factor, or it's all really theory derived. So what items go on what factors should be determined by theory. So again, so we're testing a theoretical model here. We can also have misspecifications. So if we have misspecifications, it could be we're missing important variables. Um, it could be some bad items in there too. So we, every model is gonna have some degree of misspecification. We just wanna minimize that as much as possible. Um, so something you might hear of when you talk about SVM is model identification. So this is actually critical. Um, I'm not going to make you go ahead and calculate uh, parameters that are free versus constrained within a model. We could do that, but I found that causes insanity within a, in a short amount of time. So the idea with model identification is we have to specify what is a free parameter, what's a constrained parameter, and what's fixed. So free is what's unknown. That's what we're trying to estimate. Uh, fixed is not free, but specified to a specific variable. So we can fix a loading to one to set a metric for the construct. Um, that's going to sound like gibberish right now for those who aren't familiar with CFAs or SEM, but I'm going to walk you through that when you actually get the data, and I'm going to walk you through step by step. Uh, constrained, this is used a lot when we have multiple group analysis, where we have, we're have we looking for bias in items from a measure, and we're looking at a nominal group, like looking at um, it could be sex or gender or race. We're looking at different groups and seeing, are there bias in the items? Is this a good measure? Or if there's a bias, we need to remove items to make sure we're removing and making sure we have a fair measure. So we would actually constrain parameters to be equal to one another and looking at misspecifications. We have a just identified model. That's essentially our unknowns equal the amount of unique pieces from the variance covariance matrix. If it's just identified, it's going to be an issue because we're going to get perfect model fit because it can't identify, it can't try other models within this. Under-identified we, means we have more unknowns than we do unique pieces of information. When that happens, we actually can't run the model. It will fail. We have over-identified, which means the number of unknowns is lower than the unique pieces. And this is 
this really allows us to test different types of models. So we can actually, we're really hoping for over-identified. At minimum, it has to be just identified. Uh, so when we have modification, think of it this way. In a just-identified in a just identified model, x plus y equals 5, x minus y equals 3, we have, we, from this, we can figure out, okay, we can kind of figure out what x and x, or what these are. Under-identified, we just have a single piece of information. We, we can't estimate. If we have over-identification, there's really no su simultaneous solution to all three equations, so then we can go ahead and figure out, okay, we can try different ones within this. So that's the idea when we're talking about model identification. Again, just as a quick primer, it's gonna become important when you actually use your own data within this. And I'll provide some recommendations. Typically, you want at minimum for a just identified model, three items per construct. More realistically, you actually probably want five at minimum. This way, if you have a bad item, you still have enough items to identify it. The um, for model testing, this is where we actually see we have our data and we try to fit this model to the data and see how well that theoretical model is supported by the sample data. We would use several model fit indices and we're going to talk through these and we look at recommended cutoff scores. And then we'd say, okay, how well does it fit? We use a holistic approach rather than cherry picking certain indices because if we cherry picked, then we're kind of ignoring some stuff. From there, we would just interpret more the parameters just like we would in regression. So think of it as it's regression on steroids, essentially. That's all it is. It's just a really, really, really fancy regression. But the nice thing is you can have multiple outcomes. You can do really complex mediation moderation analyses. You can actually do multi-level SEM. You can do some really fun stuff. So we're talking about how well the model fits, the, the theoretical model fits the data. We would think about things like the chi-square test. That's how our sample covariance and model implied covariances how how they align. A larger the value means it's a departure from the hypothesized model from reality. Um, this is really impacted by sample size, which is a huge issue because latent verbal modeling requires a couple hundred responses. We really can't get away with doing SEM with like 100 people or 50 people. I mean, you can try it, but you're gonna see your standard errors are gonna be really large. It's gonna be really problematic. So if you're using SEM with 500 people, well, you might have a significant chi-squared just because you have so many people within your sample. We'd also look at root mean square of approximation or RMSEA. So smaller, the better. We want to keep those errors low. So we really want to be less than 0.05. SRM or standardized root mean residuals, smaller, the better as well. So that's 0.8 or lower. Then TLI, CFI, those are models of goodness of fit. You want 95 or better for those. And you can also look at the individual uh, parameters like T values, just like regression. Um, for model modification, let's say we have a bad model, we, we'd have to then do what's called model trimming. So this is where we would leverage model identification. So like kind of looking at these modification indices, what items if we change the paths or change the relationships of these variables to improve model fit. We would want to take that, but use it within conjunction within theory. If you're just using what the computer says, hey, if you do this, you get better model fit, it becomes a game of whack-a-mole for the errors. So you really want to use caution with this. Always let theory be your guide, though. And then model parameter identification. It's essentially, this is a requirement, though, for CFAs. So when we're measuring depression or measuring happiness, we have to assign the latent variable a unit of measurement because right now it doesn't have one. So we can either do two things. We can set a reference indicator. So that path from the latent to the indicator, we're gonna set the path to one. If it's a bad item, it's gonna create a huge issue though. So you wanna have that be a good item, a good reflector of that latent. We can also standardize the factor like z-scores and set the variance to one for the factor. That's another way for identification of the parameters. Again, we're gonna talk through this with the actual data. So we're talking more conceptual right now. Uh, so for terms, like when we're looking at these, if we see a square box, that's an observed item. That's like someone's score on an item of the PCL5 or a depression inventory. Our latent variables, that's the construct. That's what we're hoping to measure. We have direct effects of x on y. We can also look at covariances or double-headed arrows within this.
that's going to be our correlations or our covariances. Uh, sorry, um, let's check. Uh, okay, um, so kind of thinking through this, this is a good kind of an example of how to visualize it. So when we're talking about CFA, it's always helpful to write out the equations, but really have a visual. So the idea is here is, um, this is a world assumptions questionnaire back when I used to do trauma research. That feels like another lifetime ago. Um, but it's the idea that like, there's different aspects of world assumptions, like trustworthiness, goodness of people, controllability of the world, uh, predictability of others, and safety of the world. The idea is each of these different constructs, they're related to each other, but they're separate. So this is a multi-dimensional scale. There's different subscales within this. They're related constructs, but separate. And the idea is that like, because of someone's underlying trustworthiness and goodness of people score uh, that construct, they're going to answer higher levels on these items. So it's because of someone's underlying construct that they're going to have higher or lower scores on these items. So that's the idea within a measurement model. It's from the construct to the items. These are reflectors. If it's the other way around, what we have is what's called partial least squares modeling, where it's more of a composite. Um, we're not going to really talk about that. It's a whole other area of structural equation modeling. I have strong feelings on it, but I'll just leave it at that. So we'd start with this overall theoretical model, but then we'd actually see, okay, well, how well does our model actually fit? So this was uh, for my dissertation. I looked at aspects of different predictors of trauma, or post-traumatic stress symptom severity. And this was kind of what my model looked like at the end. So I start with a really large model and I end up trimming some things down to get a better idea of what's, what's the truth behind this. Um, so it's just a quick conceptual idea of what CFA is and how we're going to be using it. So let me go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and put this back into the chat. There's also a copy of the slides. If you're interested, by all means, go for it. A big proponent of open coding, open data. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is if you click on that tiny URL, let me go ahead and move screens. Yeah, I need to get some more. I'll fix that later. Um, but we're, so this has some helpful articles in here. So it has some really great stuff in there. It has some more specific things for um, like the Chen recommendations for uh, measurement and variance. Mead and Bauer is a good article too. Schreiber, this is a really good one. It's a primer for structural equation modeling, walks through CFAs and reporting styles and recommendations in the slides. Uh, you'll want to go ahead and go to code and data and you want to download the R script here, as well as the CSV. The CSV is going to be our data that we're going to be using. This is from Holzinger and Swineford, 1939. It looked at different cognitive tests of uh, looking at intelligence. And that's what we're going to go ahead and use. Now, I do want to mention within this that that data is non liker so it's actually score test scores, which are going to be more of a continuous and interval. If you're doing Likert, it's going to be a similar methodology, but you're going to make some different things because you need to account for uh, non-normality because Likert tends not to play nice. Um, if you're interested in learning how to do uh, CFAs with Likert data, let me know. I have some examples I'm happy to share with you, as well as uh, kind of thinking through in the spring semester, if that's a topic that folks are really interested in, like how do you deal with Likert data for these types of models from either IRT or classical test theory, let me know. I'm happy to do a presentation on that as well, if that'd be of help. Um, but here's the R code, and let's go ahead and we'll talk through it. So um, I try to do things a little bit differently for this workshop, assuming, because normally I would assume like, oh, maybe a, a passing familiarity with CFAs. I found that not to be the case sometimes. So I want to make sure I had that primer to help kind of build a really quick um, information about this. However, that's really, in 20 minutes, I can't, or 15, 19 minutes, I really can't do a deep dive into the theoretics of SEM. So I'd highly recommend the Klein, uh, Klein book. This is the fourth edition. There's actually a fifth edition that just came out, I think, last year. The library doesn't have a copy of it yet. But this is uh, to the fourth edition, which is a fantastic one still. And there are permalinks there. Uh, the Bolin textbook, it is dated. It's from 1989, but it is like still the, one of the most referenced SDM books. And there's a permalink to the ebook from the AU library. Uh, the Schreiber page paper, which is also in the Google Drive too, which is a really good primer. So these are kind of to help you get you up and running with this. Uh, so before we start with any modeling, 
want to do first is just make sure our environment is set up. So I'm using a QMD file or Quattro documents for this, just for presentation purposes. You don't have to use this. You can just use base R script. It's fine. Um, but we want to make sure that we have everything installed. So I'd like to use this quick one. That way you don't have to install a lot of packages. So what this does is this screens your computer and says, okay, do you already have these packages installed? If not, it's going to install it for you. So I just go ahead and I click on this play button and it does its thing. Um, I already have all of these installed, so it's going to take a really short amount of time. But if this is, if you're having to install stuff, it might take a little bit of time. Um, so if you want to open up your R script and follow along with this, awesome. If you just want to watch this and try this on, later on too, that's great. This is being recorded. I'm happy to share the recording later on as well. Uh, so this will just take a couple of seconds for it to run. Um, the nice thing is within this code, I'm going to show you some quick visuals as well as some ways to make publication ready tables or just about ready publication ready um, automatically. That way you don't have to spend a lot of time. Uh, for figures, though, I'm not a big fan of figures within R for SEM. So actually, I use a program called YED. It is a little bit of a learning curve, us, but it's completely free. So if you type into Google YED graph editor, this is what I use personally when I create um, CFA models or SEM models. So it's kind of like a drag and drop. It almost looks like a shape editor. You just drag and drop it and you can make some nice models in there. That's what I personally use for reportings and for figure making. Um, so when we talk about confirmatory factor analysis, we're going to talk about three derived lane constructs. So it'll be a visual score, some items or some test scores that are related to textual intelligence, as well as speed of how well they can speed through the different tests. Uh, this is all from Holzinger and Swine for 1939. It's a really good toy data set to use. And we're going to go ahead and change school to a factor. We'll be using this for a multi-group analysis for measurement invariance later on. So first thing we do is we'll just double check the counts. I'm just reading in the data. Um, you notice that I didn't set a working directory. So actually, I recommend not setting work, working directory with any syntax because that creates so much issues. So as long as you have your R script and your data files saved in the same location, you should be fine. If it's throwing an error message, what you can do is you can go to session, set working directory, and then choose directory and just select where your data file is. I recommend that that way because if you share an R script, this is what I learned the hard way. If I put the path directory for my own personal computer, well, that doesn't help you all because your path directories are different. It has, you don't have my username on your computer and vice versa. So it's just a really good practice not to set the working directory within the script. Uh, so let's we'll go ahead and we'll do a quick descriptive statistics of the data set. You would want to test for univariate and multivariate normality and skewness, kurtosis, because those things will really impact how well the estimators work. Uh, for time, we're not doing a really deep dive into that. So this is assuming that you've already done that screening. What I find helpful, especially for measurement invariance, because when we're looking at two different groups, we're using school for measurement invariance later on, is just doing a quick describe by. Oh, I see about using the here library. Yeah, that's a really fantastic one as well. I don't use it as much, but here is a great a great library package. And then if you've got in the habit of using projects, those are, that's really good too. That way it's like have a nice little bin to store everything in. Really great comment. Thank you. Um, so if we go ahead and just do describe by, I like using the mat equals true because I can do a nice side by side. I can go ahead and see, okay, based on the kind of speed counting, I can see what the sample size is. I can also look through different descriptives for each one. So kind of a quick check of aggregating up to the school level what our descriptive statistics are. So um, before we get to actually modeling, I just want to take a quick pause and just see if there's any questions so far. Uh, feel free to unmute or if you want to put in the chat, by all means, that's great. Um, and if you all are doing pretty well, uh, just give me the thumbs up symbol and I'll go ahead and I'll just continue. I just want to do a quick pause and just do a quick check and see if there's any questions. Okay. So I see some thumbs up. Okay. 
Oh, lot of thumbs up. Perfect, perfect. Okay. Well, as you go through, if you have questions, feel free to un unmute and ask your question. Or if you're getting lost, let me know, because again, I, I don't want to lose anyone with this. So when we're talking about a measurement model, we have to write up the syntax within the Levon package. So Levon is going to be pretty much your go-to package for structural equation modeling within R. So think of it as we have to write the equations. So we're going to create an object called HS model. And we're going to do single quotes. We're going to start and end with a single quote. That way, he knows it's a textual file within this to a degree. And we're going to write what our construct is, then equals tilde, visual, perception, cubes, and lozenges. So these three manifest variables are these three variables within our data set. So if I go ahead and expand, oops, and to expand this, I can see visual, perception, cubes, and lozenges. These are numerical values, these are test scores. These would all fall under the visual construct. In the textual construct, we have paragraph completion, sentence completion, and word meaning. So these are all reflectors of this construct called textual. For speed, we have a bunch of different speeded, like addition, counting, and discrimination scores. So this would all fall under a construct called speed. So it's again, it's tilde, it's equals tilde, and that's how we're referencing construct to the reflector. Now, the nice thing is because we don't specify the correlations within this, it's assuming that these are all going to be correlated with each other. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm creating essentially our model code. So I'm storing that as an object. So it just it's that code. And we're going to pass that through a CFA function. Um, so I see a question about NAs within this. Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, so we're not going to cover anything with missing data for SEM within this. By default, if you don't choose full information maximum likelihood, so that's one of the options you can include with the CFA. If you don't include that, it's going to use list-wise deletion, which has all sorts of fun issues with parameter estimates. Um, if you were to use full information maximum likelihood, that's going to use all the information as much as possible to get a, a rough proxy of what's going on. So it's going to use that full information maximum likelihood. That's one of the gold standards for missing data. It has come under fire recently though too. So maybe you might want to consider multiple imputation. That's another way you can do this as well for missing data within a CFA or SEM. Uh, but by default, it's going to be list-wise deletion. Um, if you're interested in using FIML within a CFA, what you can do is, let me go ahead and finish running, opening this up. Hmm, computer's being a little sluggish right now. Uh, there we go. Um, doo -doo -doo. So we go to CFA. Uh, this might be problematic potentially within Likert data. So I'm hmm, not seeing that. So when in doubt, we'll Google to the rescue. Oops, not Gimel, it is Fimmel. All right, so what you would do is if you're using full information maximum likely, that's assuming your data is uh, going to be normally distributed as part of maximum likelihood, that you're using um, continuous data, probably not Likert. But then what you could do is within, so if you use missing equals ML as one of your arguments within your CFA code, then that's going to go ahead and use, so if you're using missing completely at random or missing at random, you can use full information maximum likelihood then rather than using list-wise deletion. So that's how you can go ahead and bypass that. So a uh, fantastic question. Um, so that's one method and you can also use multiple imputation as well. So you would just have a, your data, then you put a comma missing equals parentheses ML. And that's how you can fix that. So, what we have here is we're just going to use a really basic CFA function. So we just have our object name. So that's our theoretical model. And then we're referencing our data and we're storing that as an object called overall fit. And then after we run that, I'm going to just use a summary function. And I'm going to ask for fit measures equals true. So I'm going to get all the different fit and misfit as well as R squared for looking at the reflectors or indicators. So how will each latent variable is essentially measuring the item because it's going, it's going from the latent construct to the reflector. So here we have our estimated maximum likelihood. 
It is using an ester and optimization. You don't really have to worry about that. It should be fine. Now it is using, I do have one case of missing data. So just using this drop in that. We can now look at our chi-square test that is statistically significant. So right there from that, we have some issues with the specification with a sample size of about 300. Our CFI, we're looking for about 0.95 or better. This is a little bit on the low side. Same thing with TLI. We want this to be about 0.95. So again, this is a little bit low. We can then also look at our RMSEA. We want this to be below 0.8. We also want the confidence interval to 90% high or lower. We want this one to be below 0.1. So it's again, a little bit high. So we know we have some misspecifications. SR, MR, it's a little high. That's to see that maybe 0.05 a little bit below 0 0.06. So I know I have some misspecification in here, but let's pretend that we didn't. I can then look at our parameter estimates. So here we can see visual perception one. Now I didn't specify anything within the model for identification. So because of that, it's setting the first indicator. So if I go back to our model, our first indicator of every construct, it's setting that path to one automatically. That's setting the metric for identification of our latents. So because of that, we don't get an estimate or an unstandardized estimate for that parameter. So I was using that to set the metric. So we can see here for each unit increase in visual, we have a 0.54 increase in cubes within that. Because again, it's because of the visual that we're seeing scores of cubes, lozenges, and so forth. And these are all statistically significant. We also have our R squareds. In cubes, we can kind of see is a little bit on the low side as well here too. If we wanted to look at a compact model fit, I really like the glance package. So we would just put in our CFA results object into there. We get our AIC, BIC, CFI, R squared. So not R squared, but the um, chi squared within that. And this is really helpful if you're running a whole bunch of models rather than having to go scroll through the text files for each one. Um, if you're comparing this with M+, you can use the more fit models. This has so many different ones because there's actually additional model fits. Uh, M+, for a while, was just making them because each researcher had their own favorite. So they were just kind of making some of them up after a while. <laughs> Uh, this is a fantastic history on that, and they mentioned, I believe, in Quantitude, um, which is a fantastic quantitative podcast from University of Maryland and University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So that's um, Greg Hancock and Patrick Curran. Highly recommend it. Um, we can also look at the parameter estimates within a data frame. Oh, uh, season five? Actually, yeah, I saw the, uh, the announcement that. That's going to be fun. Uh, so some Quantitude folks in there, too. Awesome. I love that podcast. I love it so much. Um, so here you can actually look at, this is a brief way to kind of look at the table. So it has each of our estimates. So what we had within that text, but it's putting it in a nice data frame. Now you can use this, but I'm going to show you a better way to create a, a nice table from this instead. We can also create a visual. So what we're going to use is use the SEM paths because with CFAs, it's really helpful to get a visualization. So we have our model. We're going to have a curve pivot and then thresholds false within this. So when we do this, we get an OK model. Again, so I'd probably use YED for this instead and just hand calculate and just not hand calculate, but hand draw everything because it's how I like it. Um, with R, it's not as pretty. Um, we can also change this around so using unstandardized estimates and we'll use a fade. So here, so what we do is that fade equals true. So weaker path coefficients will have a reduction in the color. Uh, so this is really helpful if you're doing a, a quick exploratory analysis and you're not doing this for publication purposes, but just to get a quick feel for what this is. Um, there's also other options too for visuals. I'm gonna rush through this a little bit just so we have time to talk about structural regression models and measurement invariance. Again, I recommend YED, but if you want to automate this, you can. This is a complete and utter mess, so this is why I don't recommend this one. So if you do this, what you need to do is you have to rename your variables. So rather than, uh, let's see, we have the lozenges, cubes, visual perception. I'm calling this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So using short ones instead, this way it's not going to be an issue. It's not going to change the results at all. I'm just renaming the parameters. 
Again, same results as we had before, nothing's changed. But when we do the graph one, it looks mildly better. It's still not great, but we can get a sense of what the covariances are as well as the path coefficients. Um, if you're using unstandardized, this is a good option too. It's a quick way to extract the parameter estimates. We just put up, pop our model fit into here, and then we can get the unstandardized parameters, our SEs, and our p-values. So we can create a table from this. Um, if you want to do a really quick table that looks somewhat nice, we can we can use this. We can actually use um, some piping in here. So we're going to take our parameter estimates, turn it into a data set. We can mutate and then select the specific estimates and p-values, and then the term, and then we can put that into Pander. So we get a somewhat nice, this almost looks a little bit almost like data output to a degree if you kind of squint and look at it a little bit. Um, again, it's not great. Um, I can't stand scientific notation, but I'll show you a quick fix for that. Uh, so this is an okay one if as a quick screener, it makes it easier to read. Now, I really like standardized solutions. Um, again, I'm trained as a psychologist for experimental psychology, so I really like standardized scores. Um, so each standard deviation increase in the latent, there's a a subsequent standard deviation increase or decrease, hopefully increase in the indicator or the reflector. So I like standardized path coefficients or standardized factor co loadings, however you're calling them, because path coefficients, factor loadings, it's all the same thing. But with this one, we can actually, because we're using the standardization within this, for our first predictor, we can actually get our standard or standardized estimate of that path, which is really helpful. Um, if you need to switch variables to a different metric, so let's say that visual perception that wasn't a good reflector, if we just change the order, we can do that, and then that's going to change it from visual perception to cubes as setting your metric. So again, same model, nothing's changed, all the same thing with this. We do have some changes in the estimates, though, because Malfit doesn't change, but here within our latent variables, we do see changes within this because now rather than visual perception as the indicator, we're using cubes. So we will see some differences there. So again, if you have a bad indicator, we're going to see that in the model too. Um, if you wanted to fix a parameter to one, like if you wanted just to set that path from the latent to lozenges, we can just do an asterisk or one asterisk, and that's going to set that coefficient. So that way it's not going to estimate it. And R will know what to do within that. Uh, sometimes you need to do that for measurement and variance. Um, you can also look at the covariance matrix of the model implied one and see how well that fits. You can look at the residuals. So I find residuals helpful because you can see if there's anything really large for a residual, then I know there's a problem within the model. And I might want to correct for that. Or maybe omit a variable, drop a variable, might do something else with that. So we kind of would want to go ahead and screen through this and see what it is. I mean, it's a lot of information to go through, but it's important steps to take. So we can also look at the starting value. Sometimes if your model can, fails to converge, this is a quick fix because you can obtain the starting values where it left off. And then you can use this type of code within your model implied. So that way it's going to almost essentially jumpstart the model. Um, so reference, see a question about the consequences of changing reference observed value. Um, so why would we change from visual perception to cubes? Good question. Uh, so if, if we're running this and then we think more conceptually, like uh, sometimes if you have a bad reference item or the item is not as good of a reflector of your construct, then when you set in the metric, you're using a bad indicator to set the metric. So that's going to have issues of how that's related to the other items. So we want to do some checks within this. Sometimes that's why you'd want to use maybe the variance, send the variances to one instead. That way you're getting estimates for all of it. Because if you're actually using a, a bad indicator as your reference, you're not going to be able to detect that later on because you're setting that path to one. So if it's a really bad item, you might not be able to detect it. Um, so using more exploratory, what I would do is I'd use, I'd set the variance to one instead of setting an indicator. That way I can see, okay, are there any problematic items from the get-go? 
If you have a large enough sample size, I would actually do an e split the data set randomly in half, do an EFA with one half, CFA with the other half. That'd be best practices. But sometimes you don't have that amount of data. So that's that's why you'd want to kind of change that around potentially. Again, if you have a bad indicator, it's it's going to cause issues with the model later on. And it might not be that the model itself is bad, but it's just a bad item. Or maybe the item was confusing for respondents. Uh, so hope that answers that question. Now we'd also look at um, ASCBS if you want to do the model comparisons too. Uh, you can also use an LRT test or likelihood ratio. So if you have two models, you can actually see, okay, which one has better model fit? Um, we can also look at fit measures. These are all the potential ones. Some of these I don't even know because I never use them. Like the CRMR, um, we have some weird ones in there. Uh, but typically CFI, RMSEA, SRMR, those can be the ones you know almost always cite. There's a quick way to just kind of pull and extract those specific ones out there if you want. So like I said before, our model has kind of math fit. So what we can do then is we can inspect the modification indices. Again, it's going to be like a little bit of a whack-a-mole. So we would then, we would kind of see, okay, if we change the different, if we reformulated our model and changed the different relationships that would then have better model fit based on this data-driven method, we can actually improve model fit. Now, you might get a model that makes no sense theoretically, though. So you always want to let theory be your guide. So you can look at this, but again, only make decisions that make theoretical sense. Like here we say, have like if we had a direct path from visual to speeded discrimination, we would have a reduction in the chi-squared, the chi-squared test that would go down by 37.08 roughly. So we'd have improved model fit. But visual to speed of discrimination, does that make theoretical sense? That's where we have to really let theory kind of help make these decisions with this. If it makes no sense, don't do it. Because again, this is just a data-driven approach saying, well, if you change these parameters, you get better model fit. Again, it might not make sense. If you want to get a full listing, so this is just the top 10. The top one's actually above a score for chi-squared improvement of 10. That's how this is one that's doing it. So we're only getting eight or so that have above 10. With this, this is all of them. And we can go through each of these to see, okay, what well, one makes sense, what well, ones don't. Um, sometimes what you can do is you can sometimes correlate the residuals of an indicator. That's going to be more of a complex model. And you have to explain, well, how does that make theoretical sense? But if we wanted to correlate the residuals of cubes and loss interest, so something, these two variables were saying like, well, for cubes and loss interest, something similar within the test that the residuals are correlated, but it's outside of the visual that's being explained from that. So we can actually add a relationship between our residuals by using two tildes between our manifest. So when we do that, we're correlating the residuals. And we do that visual, we can see, okay, we're correlating the residuals of cubes and loss inches. If we look at the model fit, you would scroll up a little bit. We can see, okay, I mean, it did improve a little bit. So we're, CFI is close to 0.95, TLI a bit closer, but still, we have some work to do within this. Um, so we then want to go down a rabbit, not a rabbit hole, but I guess you can call it a rabbit hole of doing model trimming and trying to find a better model that's also supported based on theory. Um, so you could put this into a really nice table by hand, please, please, please don't do that. Please don't. Um, you're increasing the likelihood of making a mistake when you transpose the data from like this into like an Excel sheet to create the table or word. So this is some code that's gonna extract the different parameters to actually create a table for you. So first thing we're doing, we're storing the unstandardized path coefficients and the standardized path coefficients. We're using STD all, we're gonna use those correlation coefficients not correlation, uh, standardized coefficients. We're also extracting our R squared and our correlation between our constructs. So we're storing all of that information. What we do now is we combine it. So we're taking our unstandardized coefficient and our standardized, putting those together. And then we're zeroing out, we're creating a table within this and saying, okay, based on this, the coefficients where each one belongs. So if I go ahead and show you what table CFA looks like so far, 
I've dropped a bunch of different columns that aren't needed within this and some different rows. But now we have for visual, what's our estimates? And again, we set the metric to one on that first item. So we're storing that. So we're just getting our estimates, SEs, p-value, upper lower bounds within this. So we're just storing all of that. Now what we're doing is we're rounding to do two decimal points for everything that we need. For estimates, SE, Z, CF, or 95% CIs, and just extracting all that information and, and rounding it. So it's a proper rounding. Now we get to add structure coefficients. I love structure coefficients. So structure coefficients is essentially, if we looked at our model and we did what's called path tracing, it's if we go from lozenges to visual, and then the correlation detects that's how much lozenges could have been predictive of the textual. So actually it's textual, the correlation between visual and textual, and then you times that by your, your standardized path coefficient. So it's how much it could have been accounted for. So how much textual could have accounted for lozenges. So again, it's using path tracing rules within this. Um, so by doing that, we can get a better approach of if these multi-dimensional measurement model, if they're highly related, well, we'd expect there'd be some degree of relationship between items to other factors that they shouldn't be measuring just because they're highly related to one another. So we can extract all of those and we're kind of just sequencing it. So we're getting the first three items we're going to be missing for it because the item within its own or own construct, we're not going to get a structure coefficient. So that's why we're kind of having to alter the paths within this. And then we're also taking the correlational table. We're taking our standard estimate, timesing our correlation between the two factors. And that's how we're getting our structure coefficients manually. Um, we can also import our R squared, and we put this all into a nice little fancy table, and then we just rename this. So when we actually look at it, so all that code, but now we have our latents in a column, our indicators, our unstandardized coefficients with our standard error. We have our unstandard, we have our standardized coefficients, and then we have our structure coefficients. So the first three are visual, so we'd have no value for visual there, but then our structure coefficient of each item for textual, our structure coefficient of each item to the speed construct. So that's the way we can actually start taking this table within this. We can port this into a GT, which is a really nice thing to go ahead and create a, a nice publication, almost publication ready figure, or not figure, but table. So we can use this like, okay, this looks pretty good. But trying to put this in the JPEG to a word, not great. So you can just use GT save. And then let me go ahead and put this in here. So we have our formatted measurement model. Um, so, you, so benchmark I'd use for signal indicators are too closely related to other latent constructs. Um, if I start seeing like structure coefficients above like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, or if I start seeing like correlation between the factors of like 0.9 or higher, I would maybe consider trying to do another measurement model where I collapse those two factors into a single factor and see, does that have better model fit from like a two, like a two factor model rather than a three factor model? Um, so that's kind of what I would use within there. So it's going to be, I mean, you'd also want to test that theoretical model. So if there's arguments like uh, in, the in the trauma literature, uh, the PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress symptom severity, or the symptom clusters of PTSD, it's argued like a three-factor model, a five-factor model. So you can actually try different factors and see, okay, what best fits the data? Um, that's kind of the, I would use kind of model building techniques within that, try different models, like um, collapse a factor, see what that looks like. Again, if it has really high structure coefficients, really high correlations between the factors, then I'd really consider kind of collapsing those, that they're too related to one another. Um, so within this RTF, what we can do is I can go ahead and change layout to landscape. And then I can go ahead and just kind of restructure the columns a little bit. And make it a little bit more readable. So that way it's uh, pretty close to a publication ready table. So that's a, a quick trick I would use rather than trying to put this all into like a Word doc or into an Excel sheet. So 
that's one way to do it. You can also do things like um, if you've already run a CFA, I'd always recommend save the factor structure score or the save the factor scores or the latent construct scores, the estimates of that, because then you can use that for other analyses. Because if you're talking about latent scores, there's something like happiness, depression. Why use a sum score when you actually you've already did all the work to get the CFA scores from that? So what you can do is you can actually take your data set and you can loop this in to then extract the predicted construct scores. And you can use this for like latent variable regressions or looking at like t-tests or latent scores as well. So you can extract this and then go all the way to the end. Here's our visual score, textual and our speed. These are essentially going to be z-scores within this though because they've been standardized. Um, if you're using ordinal Likert data, um, Levon can do this. It will automatically switch to a diagonal related really squares, which is a better estimator for Likert data. Um, it uses full weight matrix to reboot to actually compute the robust standard errors, and it will adjust the test statistics. Uh, that being said, if you use this estimator, you can't use full information maximum likelihood for missing data, though. So that's the cost of it. What this would look like, so this is all commented out, though, but you would say ordered. That's one of your options, and you would list all of your indicators that are like your scale. That's going to automatically tell Levon to run this as a weighted least squares instead, or diagonally weighted least squares. That way it's going to correct for that Likert scaling. And what that does is the estimator, because it's Likert, it's going to assume that there's a threshold that's normally distributed under the Likert scores. So it's calculating that as part of the modeling within there. So you're going to get some additional output within that. Um, so... With time remaining, I'm going to talk, we'll quickly talk about multi-group CFAs and structural re regressions within this. Um, so quick show of hands. Um, out of curiosity, who, um, anyone do anything with multi-group analyses? So give me a thumbs up if you've uh, ever done like a measurement invariance or differential item functioning. If not, that's okay. So I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so this is a really, really fun analysis. I think it's fun because this is most of my personal research. This is what I do. I do uh, multi-group CFAs from a Bayesian perspective and differential item functioning. So what this is doing is we're actually looking for, are there problems within a measure where individuals have the same underlying scores of these constructs, but there's bias within the items. And that's what, so the difference we're seeing is not because they're actually different on the construct, but because there's a problem item or the measure is problematic. So I do a lot within like my personal research is looking at bias and measurement. So within this, what we do is we first start with a CFA, but then we use a grouping variable to inspect at each step, like, okay, do, are these being items being interpreted the same way? Are the response sets the same? Um, to actually be able to detect for that bias. And then if there's bias, I can go back like, okay, this item's a problem. If we remove this item from the measure, we're actually able to get a better, a, a more, a less biased measure within this for the construct. So first we start with configurable. So configurable is the idea that if, if our model is a three-factor solution, it should be a three-factor for each group, for both schools within this. So it's the same number of factors and the same indicators to factors for both our groups. So what we do is we essentially, we, we're splitting up our data by school and we're saying, well, estimate everything freely, but we have to ensure that they use the same measurement model. So essentially the same factor structure. So one school can't have a two factor solution, the other one have a three factor solution. So it is we're constraining the structure of those paths of that structure. So we'd actually look here and we say, okay, how well does our model fit? We would extract our CFI and TLI and we'd write that down. And we do this kind of a step-by-step -step comparison. So here's our, we get separate parameters. So we have our path coefficients for cubes and this is for the Pastor school. We can see they have 0.38. If we scroll down, because it's a multi-group CFA, we also have well, cubes for Grant White. This is much higher than before. So we're freely estimating by school, 
but it's retaining the same number of factors and the same indicators per factor. What we do then is we sequentially look at this and say, okay, well, do we have good model fit? So typically we want to have good model fit within the configure before we move on. So we're going to pretend that we do here. We really don't because it's a bad model fit just to begin with. What we'd want to then do is we would say, if we have the same factor structure for both schools, then we would want to say, okay, are the, um, do the, the path coefficients, so the from the latent to each parameter, are they the same? Are they going to be equivalent? If not, that means that the constructs are manifesting differently across the groups. So what we're doing is we're constraining the path coefficients to be equal across groups. So each group is going to have the same path coefficient for uh, lozenges, or same path coefficient for cubes. So what we do is we have our model here. We have our data. We're grouping it by school, but now we're saying, okay, set the loadings to be equal. So it's going to have the same exact factor loadings for both. So if we do this, we get the data. We would extract out the CFI, RMSEA, and SRMR, because we're going to see, oh, well, how much do they change? Do we have more misfit when we constrain additional parameters in the model? And that's measurement and variance. So we're hoping to have low amounts of misfit at each more constrained model, uh, because then we actually have an invariant model, which is good. Um, if there's non-invariance, then the measure doesn't hold. We have issues across groups. So if you wanted to compare means or factor means within this, you have to have at least metric. So we can then look at, we can extract this. And then we would go to what's called scalar. So scalar means it's the same response. That's for, if it was like Likert, um, strongly disagree is means the same thing across both groups. So if they have the same, so if one person from one group has the sa a sample level of the construct as someone who should have the same score. So that means they're answering the same way if they have the same latent score. We would then go ahead and run this, but now we're including intercepts. So scalar invariance is we're setting the intercepts to be the same as well. So this is a much more constrained model. Because of those constraints, we might be able to start detecting more misfit. So we look at this, oh, CFI, that just, that tanked. I mean, not too, too bad, but we went from like a 0.91 to a 0.87. So that's a 0 0.04 decrease. So that could be a problem. Our MSEA, well, that went up. That's we have more error in our model because now we're seeing more misspecifications. So we probably don't have scalar. So I mentioned that here, but we also have, so we have the P's here. This is because it's the same loadings across the groups. And we also have our same intercepts across groups. They're, they're setting to be equal across groups now. Well, this is all well and good, but you'd also want to do what's called strict invariance which is um, saying the error variance and covariance to be equal across groups means that it has the same degree of precision. Um, for other continuous, so I see a question about natural groupings. So if it's a continuous variable, that's where it gets really tricky with like a continuous grouping, like age. So you'd have to kind of break that apart into different groups because it has to be a nominal group for measurement and variance. Um, you could do things like dummy coding and have be what's called a multiple indicator or a multiple indicator multiple causes model, which a little bit more flexible than measurement invariance, uh, but it still requires uh, binary variables. So if it's if it's a continuous grouper or grouping variable, that creates an issue. Um, you'd probably have to do something like a mixture model for that, I believe. Um, it's it gets really tricky if it's not like a, a true grouping variable. Um, it's a good question. Good question. Um, let me think about that because I think there's what you could possibly do is if you use it with an, an item response theory perspective, you can include that as a covariate then, and then if there's group differences based on that covariate, that could be a workaround. But that but then you're no longer doing it as classical test theory. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about that one more. That's it gets tricky, especially if it's um, if you're looking at multiple groups and the interactions of groups. So it's a combination of like, let's say it's age, uh, race, gender. So it's combinations of variables. 
Um, so having multiple identities within that as well and having measurement invariance, that gets really tricky in terms of um, this type of modeling technique. I'd probably go more of a Bayesian route personally. Um, but if we're doing a strict invariance, so the same degree of precision, this is one of the more one of the strictest ones of measurement invariance. We can then go ahead and get the model fit from there. Now, what we would do then at each step, I was noting what the model fit is. You can do this in Excel, but what you can also do is you can compare model fit. So I'm almost like kind of I have each of our four models. I'm using a compare fit function, and what this does is we get to see where the model fit differences are. Um, so if we do, oops, it doesn't like that. So I guess they change that around, make it a quick change to that code. So we can get actually the CFI, TLI, and root mean square error within there. And we can actually, okay, which one has better model fit? A better option is using ANOVA, but that's gonna use the chi-square test as that. And if using really large groups, that's an issue. So within this, we actually have statistical significance, which we don't want at the scalar. So we could compare means, but that's about it. Because once we try to constrain the intercepts, the response sets being the same, we don't have that fit. Um, this is a quick way to do it. But what, we, what I prefer doing is rather than using the uh, chi-square test, there's things been recommended based on like, a uh, change in model fit. So you actually look at the change in CFI, which is uh, Chung and Ronsfeld or Mead et al. That's one approach. The other one is looking at a combination of RMSEA or SRMR and KAIS or in, um, in CFI. That's Chen 2007. So there's different variations within that. I like those better because they do a better job within it. So what we can do first, if we wanted to do that, is we're going to extract the model fit for each of our four models. So configurable, metric, scalar, strict. I'm binding those together and I'm calculating the change in CFI, the change in TLI, and the change in RMS or RMSEA and SRMR. So that's the difference between the constrained and the less constrained model in calculating that and then just reordering it. So all of this code to create a table. But this is going to give us so much information. So if we have this table, I can start seeing, okay, where are the drastic changes in the CFI, SRMR, and then kind of look at this, be like, okay, based on this, where is measurement invariance not being held? So I would highly recommend, there's the, the Chen article that has different recommendations based on sample size. Um, you can also use the Mead, which I believe is 0 0.001 for Delta CFI. So it didn't even, so it held at metric, but not at scalar. So then we can figure out, okay, where do we have a non-invariance within this? Uh, so that's the approach I like, because it's a little bit, in my mind, it's a little bit better. But some additional recommendations. So here's articles that you can then cite. And then finally, so we talked about CFI, CFAs, we talked about measurement variance, one of my favorites, but structural regression models. So the nice thing is if you've done a, what's called a two-step approach. So the first step is you have your CFAs between each of your constructs. Well, what you can then do is you can build a larger data set and actually run regression based on your latent constructs rather than observed scores. So if, you all, if all your research questions are in the latent variable world or the construct level, this is gonna be the analysis you really wanna consider. So using a political democracy, that's from the Bull in 1989 book. And we're gonna start with just a measurement model for um, IND60, which is these three items that's just identified. And if we run this, we're gonna see perfect model fit because it is just identified. So this is the risk of only having three items. We have perfect model fit. And that's because we only have three indicators, so it's just identified. So that's an issue, but if we had a fourth item, that'd be better. So that's why I really recommend at least at minimum three. What we can then can do is we have, we built our, S, this is our CFA. We can then do one for DEM60. And we can do the same thing. So we're just running individual CFAs for all of our constructs. We're ensuring that they have good model fit. 
This one, it does not. We're going to pretend it does, though, just for this exercise. Again, not great model fit. And then we have DEM65, so we're going to have a couple of CFAs here. Again, we want to make sure it has good model fit at each CFA before we use the regression because we're building upon our CFAs for our regression. So if you have really bad foundation, well, it's going to be an issue later on. So you go through the process of running CFAs for each one, but now we have, these are our measurement models. Now we combine all of this into a structural regression. So we have our CFA for IND60, our CFA for DEM60, our CFA for DEM65. And then we're going to go ahead and regress DEM60 on IND60. We're going to regress DEM65 on IND60 and DEM60. So actually we're building our structural regression. So we're regressing these on these other variables. And we're also going to correlate some of the residuals within this. So when we run this, this is our structural regression model. We've built in our measurement model, and we're adding direct paths to our different latent variables. So when we run this, we can then see how well does this overall structural regression model hold? Really, really good model fit. This looks good. Yes, yeah, so from this, I think, okay, this looks good. Now let's go ahead and interpret the paths. So we have our latent variables. This is all well and good, but this is just our measurement model to a degree. If we scroll down, here's our regressions. So DEM60 regressed on IND60. Once we have our unstandardized estimate, and then we have STD all, that's our standardized estimate. Then we also have some other information there too. But let's go ahead and view the model from there. So we can actually look at those paths within this. So we have, if we flip this, it's essentially we can then look at mediation within this too. If you're doing mediation, there's some additional code. So on the Levon package, if you go over to so there's information about categorical data. So if you have Likert, that's how you can do it. If you're doing mediation, you can actually add in the indirect pass. We'll actually calculate what's indirect and what's the total effect for mediation analysis. So this is really, really great code to use. You can actually have multiple mediators within this as well. So you can have multiple indirect effects and total effect. So it's really, really great information to have. Let me go ahead and put this in the chat because this is a lot of fun to do too. So looking at this, so this is our model. We can then go ahead. I always like to kind of double check what we have installed. Here's some fantastic online resources. So in May, it's it's still super early to talk about this, but every May, Kern and Bauer, their, um, their center stat work, they do a free SEM. It's like a three or four, it's a three day workshop for free where it's all day for three days on the basics of SEM into more advanced stuff. I've, I've done it a couple of years in a row. It is phenomenal. They also have the archived workshop. It's also completely free. They give you all their code. They show you how to do it in R, in I believe Stata and M+. So it's really, really great. I can't recommend it enough. Uh, some other recommendations too, if you're going through some more specific stuff. If you're interested in Bayesian SEM, um, it's really great stuff too. Uh, so it's more flexible than regular SEM, but it has some additional, uh, has its own quirks and issues, it takes a lot longer to run, but some fun stuff and some other recommendations. Um, so I know this was like a fire hose of information. Uh, we didn't go into too much detail with everything, but it was kind of more, it's kind of the greatest hits within this. You can do a lot of things like bifactor models, um, interaction effects, mediation, uh, you can also use this if you're doing their process models as well. So this is also an option too. Um, recently, they also announced that they can do multi-level SEM within Levon too. It's not going to be as uh, built up as like M+, but it's also a great option too. Yep, uh, so I see there's a question. Um, hi, I hope it's okay if I just chat rather than, than putting it in sure. the chat. But well, um, I was just curious about moderation um, and I not so familiar with SEM world, but in, you know, 
I guess the kind of regression I was brought up in, it was very common that if you had moderation effects that you would do them in a regression as sort of an interaction term, multiplicative term. Mm -hmm. um, but my impression is that within SEM world, it's much more common um, to do like a subgroup analysis, like you showed us to do how to do a CFA, but also even when you get to the structural part, um, and I was just kind of curious, any insights you kind of have about that um, and, you know, whether whether I can kind of force it to do it the way that I'm used to, or if it really does make a lot more sense to do subgroup analysis type stuff. Sure. Um, so I, I think it, it really depends, to be honest. Um, so full disclosure, my, my dissertation, it was a uh, latent variable interaction term. Uh, so it's uh, multiple interactions within this. And at the time, R couldn't do that. This was, uh, this was 2015, 2016. It just, it, it was not happy. So I had to use M plus for this. Um, so there's different variations. So when you create the interaction terms, there's different ways to go about doing this. So depending on how you structure and how you write that up, there's going to be a slight difference because then you also want to account for, especially if it's a composite variable or a latent variable, then how are you going to essentially do those interaction terms? So uh, the Klein book, I haven't checked out the fifth edition yet because I haven't had a chance to get the copy yet of it. But at least in the fourth edition, it has a whole chapter just on mediation and moderation and recommendations for it. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend that. Um, that way you don't really necessarily have to do subgroup analysis, but it walks you through then how, with it, especially with an R, how you'd set up the structure to be able to accurately get that nonlinear relationship. Because essentially it's going to be nonlinear when you do the interaction term. Um, so I would highly recommend that uh, because you can also, it gets really tricky with the paths within it, kind of thinking through it. Now, if you're using M+, the nice thing, it's super easy. It's, it's literally, you create an asterisk on it and you're good to go. Um, it, it's ridiculously easy, but M plus is also ridiculously expensive. It's like a thousand bucks for a license. <laughs> I love it, but it's it's not cheap. Um, the important thing though, regardless of what program you're using, especially for the interaction terms, is it's going to be probing that interaction. Um, so what I tend to do is I, I have it save all the scores and then... I use the scores for the individual probing and then do the plus or minus the standard deviation, essentially using that latent scores and then putting it back into just a really basic interaction testing. That's what I've typically do. Um, there's, I think through, um, and that's kind of, that's the process I would do. So I would try different things within the models within it and then also kind of see, like if your research question, if it's not looking specifically at the subgroups per se, um, I guess I'm of the mindset, why discretize a variable if you don't have to? Because I, I don't want to lose variance, though, essentially. So I always say really hesitant on that. But if it's really about the subgroups as your specific research question, then I'd go that route. So kind of I'd always bring it back to like, what's your overall question? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thanks. And just one quick follow up. You said that yeah. you couldn't do so much with the interaction terms in R when you were writing your dissertation. Have they added more of that? Or is it still kind of spotty or you're not sure? Um, I haven't really tried to do too much with the interactions within R. I know that um, I think I've definitely done a lot more of the media or the the mediation within R for Levon. It's super super easy now. Um, the for the interaction effect, I think it's more um, trying to think of like the equations and how you would write that up because with especially the item level the measurement model. But the actually, let me go ahead and. I'm saying all this and I'm realizing they might actually have modifications. Um, let's see. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Uh, so Levon actually has a really active uh, Google group. The um, Terrence Jorgensen, the creator of Levon, actually comments on there a lot. Um, so looking at this, it looks like... We're going to put the link to the Google group. Uh, so when in doubt, I always kind of Google it, just double check it. So it looks like you can use SEM tools. Um, so it can't produce the estimates of the interactions among latent variables. This was back in 2013, though. So this is a really, really, really dated post. And I know Tense has done a lot of work on this since. Um, 
but I think what you can do is the Bayesian approach of using, uh, there's another package called Blavon. That approach, that could be another option too, if you're using it as a Bayesian framework, a little bit more flexible. Um, that could be another option too. Um, but yeah, I'd have to do some more double checking and some testing with the code to, to make sure. But I think you can, I think it's come a long way in the last like uh, five or six years though. So I, sure. I think it's definitely worth a route. Yeah, um, yeah, I'll definitely look into it more. I've mostly only played around in SEM with uh, Stata so far, okay. um, but so you, you helped get me to the the stage, I think of feeling like I know what to, how to get started in R now and I can definitely look into it more. But thanks, this was super helpful. Oh, good, good. Um, and if you, as you're looking through stuff, um, if it'd be helpful for me to kind of take a look at some interaction stuff within Levon, um, feel free to send me an email just as, because my memory is horrible. So I should write it down really quick right now, but if you want to send me an email afterwards, like um, any resources on interactions within Levon for latent variables, I can spend some time, double check it's where I can find, and I'm happy to send that out to you. Just let me know. All right. Thanks. Thanks a lot. No problem. Um, any other questions? So I know we're at time, but happy to stay on for a little bit. I hope this was helpful. And this is kind of just the basics of SEM. Um, but it's it's fun stuff. I, I love SEM because you're talking about constructs. Why not keep it at the construct level? Um, but again, like uh, there's also the evaluation there too. Uh, so if, before you all go, feel free to go ahead and uh, complete that. And if there's topics you're really interested in, like if you want to learn more about IRT or like if you have Likert data, how to do this from the IRT perspective, even just like how to do a CFA with Likert data and like the steps to go about doing that because it's a little bit different sometimes. Let me know. I'm always looking forward to doing like different types of programming. That'd be most helpful for, for you all as researchers. So send me an email, let me know. And if I'm not sure of something, I'll, I'll double check it and I'll get back to you because I get to learn the process and that makes it fun for me. But I just want to say thank you all for, uh, for coming to this workshop and I hope it was helpful.